but we are continuing in the series on created in him for good works that is uh, created for accomplishing things for God we're intended to do for him and I wanted to look at John the prophet John often called John the Baptist although he is more of a baptizer but looking at John because he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness and he also is calling people to action, calling people to do on behalf of God. And uh, it seemed like it's worth looking at his teaching, uh, you know, to get in our minds the concept of repentance and what, what that means, what that looks like, and what he's calling for. And I think that he does present to us uh, fundamentals about this that are quite useful. So without further ado, we're over to Luke 3. All right, there is one more I do. I've got to open this Bible. And then it's Luke 3. Where the record shows in Luke 3, verses 3 through 6, this John went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill made low, and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall, uh, shall see the salvation of God. And these things are, of course, recorded for us in Isaiah 40, which I'm going to turn to for a moment. But in Isaiah 40, the concept of these particular words with making this uh, straight path, as it says, the prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That's Isaiah 40, verse 3. Through the wilderness. So the prophet is where we're going with this. It, it is what was said before by Isaiah, and it was intended, and it was written with intent to say what is happening now um, with John, but also it is written with these things in mind. You know, there's a wilderness, if you will, which is to say the untamed land, the place that has not yet been brought into subjection. That's where we're going to build this thing, which is a highway for God. A straight highway. The valley shall be lifted up, the mountain and hill made low. You know, today when we do this with a highway, we build an overpass to get over a valley, you know, or a bridge. And uh, we build a tunnel to get through a mountain, right? But this is saying those things should be leveled. So it's constantly on the ground, but the ground has been moved. The ground has been changed. Where there's a hill, it should be brought down to fill in the valley. Where there's a mountain, it should be brought down to fill in the canyon. So that there's even, flat, straight road or highway. The uneven ground becomes level, the rough places a plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. All flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. It's saying there's a road that's being built for God to come in. That's what it means. What's being written is that God is to come in through this place that is currently untamed and is currently un, or, uh, inhospitable, not ready for travel, not ready uh, to make it easy for the king and his entourage to enter, but we're going to make it ready. 
We're going to get plow through the wilderness. We're going to knock down the mountains and fill in the valleys so that there is a road, a straight road, a wide, open, flat, even, you know, make it so that God can get here as quickly and as easily as possible. That's the point. And the larger point in Isaiah is really verse 1 of Isaiah 40, comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. It's the purpose of this passage that God intends for the people to be comforted by this message. The purpose of John is to bring the people of God comfort. That's the point of Isaiah 40. Where is the comfort coming from? You know, why are we comforted in this? Well, in part, we're comforted because the king is coming. Jesus is coming. The gospel is coming. The kingdom is to be established. Forgiveness of sins, this is true, but it's also comfort because we are repenting. We are changing ourselves to be ready to receive that gospel. The wilderness, right? The wilderness is us. We are the untamed. We are the area that is rough and not ready, and we need to get straightened out if we want God to come in. That's the meaning. It's a real comfort, but only to the people who really are the people of God. Nobody else wants to hear that message. <laughs> But that's the nature of God's word, and that's the nature of God's people. We do. We do want to know this. So we are going back to Luke chapter 3. Yeah, what does it mean? It means clear the road. Clear the road. Get, you know, this is construction. There's work to do. We were told plainly that Isaiah 40 is about John and what he's doing. So when God says, comfort my people, here is the response. Luke 3, verse 7, Therefore he said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you, God's able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's the response to comfort my people? That's what you do? Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is, because before there can be comfort, there has to be work. Before there can be comfort, there has to be repentance. We have to want to be right with God. The road has to get cleared. Before he can come in, we have to level the field. Yes, he said to them at the seventh verse, you brood of vipers. It, and who did he say this to? It said, the crowds that came out to be baptized by him. These aren't even the people who decided, I'm just going to stay home. That guy's crazy. You know, I'm not a fanatic. <laughs> no, these are the people who wanted to come out, who wanted to hear his teaching. They came out in order to be baptized by him. And his message to them was, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Who warned you? Why would he say something like this? They came out. Well, it's true. You know, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. 
The people who stayed home, they had no chance of knowing God. But those who came out to hear John, who is actually God's prophet, they have a chance to hear what God says. Some of them who went out to hear him didn't, though. Some of those who came out to John did not listen to what John said. Therefore, they did not listen to what God said. It did not benefit them to be there. It did not benefit them to show up. When he says, who warned you? What he means is, did someone light a fire under you? (laughs) Why did you come out here? Something wrong? Something to see? You know, and I might even ask, are you, are you even flammable? Can, can anything light a fire under me? Is there any reason to be concerned? Is there any cause here? Should I be concerned about my soul? Should I be concerned about the truth? Do I need to listen to God in his word? Because that's the meaning. How did a warning get into your heart? is what he means. How did this happen? You took warning? I wasn't expecting that. What does it mean? It means you're not one to listen. You don't want to hear it. You don't want to know what God wants you to do. You already know. You're already perfect. You're already good. That's what that means. Who warned you? Can the warning even get in? Do you hear anything? That's why Romans 10 said what it did when Paul said about Israel, my heart's desire and prayer for them is that they may be saved. They're not saved, but he wants them to be saved. Just like I want to be saved and I want you to be saved. And I think that you feel the same way for me. But he said, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They have a zeal, but it's not directed by knowledge. Knowledge comes through the word of God. Knowledge comes by fear. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise knowledge and instruction. But he said, they have a zeal, but it's not knowledge. They, Romans 10 verse 3, being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own righteousness would not submit to God's righteousness. And that's the story right there. We want them to be saved. They have a zeal, but the knowledge is not there. Why is the knowledge not there? Because they are not submitting to God's righteousness. They're seeking to establish their own The ignorance comes from the desire to be justified, the desire to be right. You know, that's the way that it is. Um, Yeah, that's the way that it is. I mean, before I was a Christian, I was, uh, you know, I was a happy little Catholic clam you know, buried in a nice little Catholic beach. (laughs) Everything was cool. Everybody around me said that was a good thing to do. My parents said that was a good thing to do. My grandparents said that was a good thing to do. And then somebody came around with the Bible and said, here's what the Bible teaches, and it's not what we have been doing. Which, of course, made me angry. Uh, I thought, well, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So, I, you know, I was a little extreme, but what I did was I picked up a Bible and read it. That's what I did. Because I thought, well, we're going to beat him at his own game. I'll read this, and then I'll be able to answer him. And, you know, the prob- that's where the problem happened happened. You know, that's where the problem came in, which was, I read it, and he actually was not wrong about that. (laughs) This book did not say what I thought it said. This did not contain what I was doing, after all. And for all the good people who meant well, 
who told me that it was good and it was right to be Catholic, they were wrong. They were wrong. I didn't know. I had a zeal, but it wasn't knowledge. I wanted it to be, you know, my team, my, my group, Catholics, you know, they're the, they're the best, they're the original. You know, that's what they, that's what they think. When you do that, you're not subject to God's righteousness. You're not listening to God's righteousness. You think that you know, you think that you have the answer. So that's why they ask, why, how did you get warned? How did you hear? It's true. It's hard to escape the world. It's hard to get out. But the other thing he said to them in Luke 3, at verse 8, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, which is to say, there's something that really shows a change of heart. If you are repentant, if you're actually repentant, your heart really has changed and you serve God, then that means your behavior will be different too. There'll be a change in the person that you are. The fruit that we bring forth to God is a fruit in keeping with repentance. Now I think of James 2 on this, on this. It's 14 down, well, pretty far to the end there, but he said, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but doesn't have works? Can that faith save him? That's James 2.14. It isn't any good to say, I believe in God. I, I know God. I've, I've heard his word. Uh, I can even say his word. I, I, you know, maybe I've got it memorized. You know, um, That's one thing, but, and that's a good thing. But what good is it if it doesn't have works? Yeah. It's not any good if it doesn't have works. If there's not something following that that shows what we believe. And he gives the example of a brother or sister poorly clothed, lacking daily food. He said, you, if you tell them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, but you don't give them what they need for the body, well, what good is that? Yeah, it doesn't work. It's not enough to say, you know, to feel, to wish. You got to do, have to act, take it in hand and do something with what you know. Knowledge doesn't save, applied knowledge saves. And, you know, he concludes it in the 26th, the body apart from the spirit is dead. Faith apart from the works is dead. We can't please him in word alone. We have to have word and deed. There has to be fruit that is following or in accordance with, you know, commensurate with repentance. If we're changed, if we're different, then the actions should be changed and different too. The other thing he said to them there at... at uh, Luke 3, verse 8, is do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you, God can raise or is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Now, that's Luke 3, verse 8. But he said, do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. And you know, that would have been a great temptation. They're living in Israel. They're not the people who stayed home. They're the people who came out. They wanted to be there. And they are the descendants of Abraham. That's true. They are a special nation, a special people. That is true. But that has nothing to do with it. That's what he said. Don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. You know, no matter how good our father may or may not have been, you know, maybe your father did not raise you Catholic. Maybe your father was a Christian, and that's good. 
He wasn't Abraham, though. <laughs> and even Abraham is no claim for the descendants of Abraham in the flesh in Israel. Don't begin to say we have Abraham as our father. That, that's not even, that's a non-starter, we would say. Don't begin means that's a non-starter. That has nothing to do with this. People say church is about family. That's denominational people. That's not what the Bible says. That's denominations. The Bible never actually says something like this. It's true that the Bible regulates families, what kind of father I should be, what kind of husband I should be, what kind of son, what kind of brother I should be. That's certainly regulated and given to me in God's Word and to you. But this isn't about family. This is about God. This assembly is about God. We're to worship God. In Matthew 12, the record shows... When Jesus was teaching and speaking to the people, there was a small group of people who were not there, who were not listening to his teaching. Who were not benefiting from the words that he brought forth which were not his own words, but the word of God. Who is that? Well, it's his mother and his brothers, Matthew 12, 46. While Jesus was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. So there, he's teaching the people the words of this life, and they're going to stand outside and try to pull rank? Like he's got, he answers to them. They've got to come out to him because why? Because that's my mother and that's my brothers. That's my family. Family comes first. No, no, unless you're worldly. That's when family comes first, when you're worldly. That's not the Bible. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus replied to the man who told him, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Stretching out his hand toward his disciples, the people sitting there listening to the word of God, he said to them, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. That's what Jesus said about it. We're children of Abraham by faith, not by flesh. We're not physical descendants of Abraham, and our physical um, ancestors are irrelevant to the Spirit. It's irrelevant. Whether they were good or whether they were evil is irrelevant. I answer for myself, and you answer for yourself. And God doesn't have grandchildren. Jesus said those who hear the word of God and do it, those who do the will of the Father are his family. And that's the way it is. That's who we are. That's who we're supposed to be. Yes, and in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, he said, No one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. Circumcision is not outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. This one's praise is not from man, but from God. No one is a Jew outwardly, nor is circumcision physical. The child of God is a child of God inwardly. Circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the Spirit. It's not about where we came from or who came before us. 
what our names are, who we're related to. Don't get to thinking that, you know, the things that we read uh, earlier. Get this thing that he said in Luke In Luke 3, 7, you brood of vipers, who warned you? How did you get warning? You know, we're looking at that and we're thinking, well, it's hard to get warning when you're out in the world and everybody around you is saying something that's not what the Bible teaches. That's true. But did you think that it only applies to them? That doesn't apply to those of you whose parents were Christians? Of course it applies to you. I hope your parents were good, but they might not have been. I hope they did what God said, but they might not have. Just because they were Christians doesn't make it so. Do you think that doesn't apply to you? It does. It applies to all of us, no matter who we're descended from, no matter what tribe we came from. That's not how God reckons righteousness. Why do we say these things? Because... We have to be able to let God in. And God can't get in if we're filtering everything he says by our think so, our family, our tradition, what we've always known, what we've always heard. If that's what you're looking for, you're not looking for the truth. You're not looking for the Bible. And it's not helping you. It's hurting you. It's killing you. It's killing you. That's not right. I said, finally in Luke 3, bear fruits in keeping with repentance because every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Luke 3, verse 9. John introduces the idea of bearing fruit, and fruit, of course, is from the tree, and the tree, he says, that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, which is what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 19, when he was talking about a tree is known by its fruits. He said, every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's a direct quotation of John's teaching on this matter. The tree is known by the fruit that it makes. Whether or not I am a child of God in truth is known by whether I do God's will. That's the deciding factor. That's the judgment. That's how you know. The tree is known by its fruits. Just because it's a tree, <laughs> you know, that doesn't mean it's okay. Just because it's a tree of a certain kind of fruit, that doesn't mean it's okay. It has to bear fruit. That's the point of the parable in the 13th chapter of Luke. In the 6th through ninth verses, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none, and said to the vine dresser, Look, three years now I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree. I find nothing. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? The vine dresser answered him, Sir, leave it alone this year too until I dig around it and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, then you can cut it down. The master said, It's been three years. There's no fruit. Why should it use up the ground? God expects a return on our lives. Repentance is not a thing you do one time, you know. It's not, you know, one of the steps of the, uh, in the five-step plan of salvation. Well, okay, it is one of the steps in the five-step plan of salvation, literally. But it's not something you did one time on your way to the water of baptism. It's a change of heart from now on. You know, David was faithful as a king. And as a general rule, David did what was right and what was good, but he didn't always do what was right. He also committed murder. He also did some horrible things. But when the prophet was sent to tell him what he had done, his heart was still 
a repentant heart. He still received the word of God. He still received the rebuke of God and made himself right in repentance. He was willing to be subject to the word of God without thinking about where it's coming from or who it's coming from. Because he was that kind of a heart. And that's the way we are supposed to be. We should be a repentant heart that is always listening to God's word so that we are always able to bear fruit. I don't want to be blindsided by sin in life. I don't want to be engaged in something that is wrong, that is a practice that, that offends God, that's going to keep me out of heaven and have that be a surprise on the judgment day. I don't want that. I want to know now. If something isn't right, I want to know that. I want to make it right. I think you do too. And the parable in Luke 13 is pointing at just this problem. There's a fig tree. He's had years. The master's looking for a return. There isn't one. He said, why is it taking up space? Cut it down. But there's an intercessor, a mediator. Jesus is our mediator. Our stay of execution from that judgment. But you only get one more year. <laughs> we don't, you know, we don't continue in sin that grace may abound. He makes an opportunity for us to do right, but it's not forever. God expects to get a return on that investment. These are the things, these are the things that John said when they came out to him to be baptized, and they are the things that Luke told us correspond to Isaiah 40, comfort, comfort my people. Again, I would think these words are not that comforting. What John's saying is pretty harsh. Yes, that's true. But it is what leads to comfort because we have to get right with God. Our comfort, if we have any, is from God. The forgiveness of our sins. Righteousness. In this present life. Then we have real comfort. If our family doesn't want to be with us or if our family did wrong and it's a sad thing we can take comfort in god who will not do wrong who is a perfect father in jesus who is a perfect brother and in our brothers and sisters here in this life who are like family to us that's true i've definitely had many brothers and sisters in christ i've had many fathers and mothers in christ and some sons and daughters too. That's the promise of God. Nobody who's had to leave those things will not inherit many times, many times that amount in the church. There is real comfort for the real people of God. And that's the voice of John crying in the wilderness. So we have perhaps some other things to look at in this regard. But for the moment, we'll leave these thoughts and come back. Today, are you a Christian? Are you a child of God? Have you obeyed God? Have you made it right in your heart? Are you a different person today? Are you ready to become a different person? Repent in the heart. Obey Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in baptism for forgiveness of sins. John was preparing the way for Jesus who would come after him. That's why he was teaching a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. That's why he was the response to the comfort of Isaiah 40. That's what we do. Straighten ourselves and our lives out so that Jesus can come in. If you have not put Jesus on in baptism, if you've not repented of your sins, do it today. There's no reason to wait. And he, as the mediator, will show great mercy and he will help you in life to overcome. And God is faithful, we're told. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to withstand, but with any temptation will provide a way of escape too. There's always a way of escape. Well, we weren't promised that we wouldn't be tested, or we wouldn't be tempted, <laughs> or that we would uh, never sin again. That was not promised, but we were promised that there would always be a way of escape. God would always be on our side, and he would help us. Today, are you a Christian who has not lived right? Repent, make it right with God, pray God for forgiveness in the heart. Let us pray with you and for you if that is uh, uh, something that we can be of service in, I can all but guarantee there's not something that you're going to ask for help with that, you know, is not common to your brethren that, you know, I haven't or other people haven't seen before, haven't dealt with before, have not themselves been tempted or troubled by before. We help each other. This is not, um, you know, the place of holier than thou. This is a place where we're coming together to help one another on to God. And we're just servants. God is the audience. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song that's been selected. <laughs>